Um, my portion will be short, and then I'll, I'll hand it over to, to Doug, and then if anybody needs to ask me any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Um, but first, would like to recognize a few people. Um, Matt Lynch, State Rep, thanks for coming. John Hackman, School Board, thanks for coming, appreciate it. And Tim, with uh, Dave Joyce's office, Congressman Joyce's office, thank you for coming, appreciate it. Um, if I sound a little hurried, you see a little sweat beating on the side of my face right now, it's because there are movers at my house right now to miss me. Um, if you haven't heard the rumors, yes, I am, I am leaving Ohio. Um, by the end of the week, I will be unpacking uh, in, in Illinois. Mm. I know, I know. Um, but uh, I uh, wanted to say a couple of things um, before I hand it over to, uh, to Doug in more ways than one. Um, but uh, I want to tell you all, really, what an honor it's been to, uh, to be the president of the club uh, and to, uh, to have the opportunity to, to meet so many great people that are very passionate about what they do. Um, it, it has been a great um, process for me. Um, I, I had been involved in politics when I was in college and then got out of it, you know, because life's, life's happening all the time and doing careers and things of that nature. And so when I moved to Ohio, um, Marilyn Mattia was the person I have the credit with me getting involved. And, uh, and I really thank her for that. Um, other people I would like to thank for, for helping me through all this. Dennis Tidmore, who's been very instrumental in, in, in getting me involved as well and bringing me into the club and, and showing me and introducing me and all that. Um, Doug McGill, just absolutely could not say more things about what a great help you've been to me and, and therefore counsel and mentor. Uh, and, and really, pretty much, I, I could list everybody. It will take long, and so I'm sure I'll miss a lot of people um, by doing that. Um, but uh, I do want to say it has been a pleasure. Um, and, you know, if there's one thing that I feel is very important right now, uh, which I really strive to do with the club, uh, is really to be a vehicle to make everybody feel comfortable. Um, I didn't want uh, for it to be a cheerleading section. I wanted it to be something that makes you think, uh, might make you a little angry, um, but at the end of the day, you've heard maybe an opinion that you haven't heard before, or maybe you, you agreed with an opinion, but you didn't know it. Um, and, you know, disagreement from time to time is not a bad thing. Uh, and you know, I think that discourse. And people seeing us go through that and at the end of the day get up and shake hands and come back the following month uh, is an important process for everybody outside of this group to see us continue to do. That's another reason why we do the, do the video on YouTube and make those available so that people that can't come or you want to forward the link to somebody and, and show it to them. Um, all that's very important. Um, I highly encourage you if, you, if you've gone back to look at our archives, you can go into the website and you can see the things that we've done over the last year and a half. And if, there, if you see something you like, please forward it to people uh, in the area so that they learn more about what we are about uh, and what we're trying to do here. Because I think it's very important. There are big differences between us and, and the other parties. Um, and I, you know, I don't agree with everything, you know, pretty much everybody says. Um, but I agree on a lot of core principles that keeps me coming here every week and passionate enough to keep coming and be involved and to, to take a leadership position. So, but thank you all for the opportunity to do this. I really do appreciate it. Um, some logistics. Um, probably in the next couple of weeks I'll be uh, getting with the board and talking about the transition. Uh, and uh, according to the bylaws, Doug McGill would step in as president. Um, and those of you that haven't been here, th this all was like, has been known even before the election. So, so people elected me knowing that I was going to be leaving halfway through the year. Um, but Doug will be stepping in. Uh, Dennis Tidmore will be the, uh, the nomination committee chairman because um, he's, he's been doing it so much here lately. We were like, why, why not, you know, utilize some of that, uh, some of that, uh, that, that, you know, the grease skids, just keep it going. Uh, but uh, 
so they'll be taking nominations when when there's an announcement made that uh, that there's now an opening. Uh, that opening will be for vice president. Um, and then if somebody from the board runs for that vice president position, then there may be another position open up that we have to deal with as a follow-on meeting. So just wanted to get that out clear and open. So um, that having been said, um, the movers are at my house right now. Um, my wife looked at me as I came here and she said, please tell me you're not going to be there all night like you usually are. Uh, so if you see me skip out, I apologize. Um, it has been, been great. Uh, to be with you all. And at this time, I would like to hand it over to Doug to be able to carry on the rest of the meeting. Yeah, special thanks to Bob. He's really been a wonderful president. It has been a joy <coughs> to work with him. And uh, he's really brought a lot of class and a lot of equanimity to everything that we've done. And I can't thank him enough for doing what he's doing. And uh, we certainly wish him well. Uh, on his move to Illinois, although he could have chosen a state with less challenge politically for him. <laughs> I, I like opportunities. Yes, you've I got like opportunity. <laughs> anyway, I uh, uh, in, am in a different organization with uh, Dr. Deborah Owens. She is a former school board member, I believe, for the state school board. She is a professor uh, of education at this point, and I. Several members over the past few months have asked me if we could have a speaker on education and common core. And so I went to Deborah and I said, Deborah, would you be interested in talking to us? And she said, Oh no, I've got the perfect person. This person is an expert, has an, uh, a national reputation, probably one of the best people in the state to speak on this. She's a former public school teacher. Uh, she is the president of Eagle Forum in Ohio. Uh, she is the legislative director for uh, American Roundtable, is that the name? American Policy Roundtable. American Policy Roundtable. Uh, she has done approximately 350 or more of these presentations to people. She attends every single state school board meeting so she knows what she's talking about. She's very well connected legislatively in terms of the people that are writing legislation and involved in all the educational issues for the state. And so I can't think of anybody better to come speak to us, the Melanie Elsie. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to sit as long as you can hear. Can everyone hear me? Well, I'd yep. rather you see the screen than me. <laughs> um, what we're going to be doing is a little bit of background information. Uh, hindsight is 2020. If you understand the background information, what has been happening over the last two decades or more uh, in education policy is just a changing of the label on the package. It's the same system, just more of it with a different label. So if I walk you through what developed at the beginning, we're not going to know how to eliminate poor policy unless we understand it. It's kind of like pulling a weed out by the root. If you don't get it out, it's going to grow back. And um, for those of you who've been working in your yard, I'm sure that's <laughs> not a, a good analogy to use at the moment. Um, this first slide, this, I'm, I'm going to walk you through it. I'm going to make, try to make this part as painless as possible um, in terms of the, the amount of information. Back in the early 90s, really the late 80s, Ohio began moving toward a system of education that was um, geared toward outputs instead of inputs. They labeled the system in the early 90s as outcome-based education. There was a concurrent resolution, it was concurrent resolution 53 <coughs> that was passed by the General Assembly, I believe it was in 1992. Um, maybe the fall of 91. This memorandum uh, came from the state superintendent. His name at that time was Ted Sanders. So this is the state superintendent's memo to a committee of individuals who were charged to come up with restructuring the standards for schools. Um, part of their responsibility, as you'll see here, was to focus on the skills, knowledge, and attitudes that students would need to live, learn, and work in a global society. So there were three domains that the standards must uh, were required to cover, um, those three. 
by February of 93, and that was a budget year. The budget that year was House Bill 152, and, and Governor Vornovich was governor. Um, we had the goals, the Education Goals and Strategies Commission and the State Learner Outcome Panel were two separate groups of people. Uh, the Goals Commission drafted out 11 goals, and the Learner Outcomes Panel drafted out 25 measurable outcomes, what would be assessed of students to make sure they had reached these goals before graduating. Um, the uh, learner, back then, back in 1993, we didn't have computer systems, we didn't have websites, we didn't have electronic, me and electronic means for, to gain public input. So 55,000 hard copy paper surveys were sent out from the Department of Education to regional meetings. I participated at the one in Stark County at the Drag Center. Um, the surveys we received were basically whether or not the measurable outcomes fit and would correctly measure the goals. We were never asked if we liked the goals, which was a flaw in the survey process. Um, <laughs> The goals were to participate as a productive member of a global society, maintain wellness, act in an ethical manner, value diversity, communicate effectively. Um, on down the list, they're all affective. There are no hardcore academic goals here. They're all um, on the soft skills. So if you have those 11 goals, how do you measure them? Um, does the student function as a responsible family member? How do you test that? Does the student maintain physical, emotional, and social well-being? Emotional well-being is linked to mental health. How do you test that of a 17 and 18 year old to make sure they can graduate from high school? Um, if you look on down the list, what isn't on this list is reading, science, mathematics, <laughs> history, nothing. So as the budget process was moving through and uh, there was a, about a 400 plus page portion of House Bill 152 that dealt with bringing this system in. Uh, as you can imagine, the hearing rooms were filled with parents <coughs> that were saying, no, we don't want this. <coughs> so as a result of that, there was language added to the temporary portion of the budget in the back, not the statutory portion, but the I'm sure you all are aware the budget has a two-year biennium. Language was added that prohibited the Department of Education from developing standards um, in this domain and restricted them to the academic and vocational domains. The legislators believed that that would prevent them from assessing students' attitudes, belief systems, etc. So this was in um, February of 93. We're now going to go to, and the budget was signed at, in July, July 1st of, or yeah, July 1st of 93. So this next document uh, was at, I was at the state board meeting, state board of education meeting, and this is dated September of 93. So two months after the General Assembly told the Department of Education, don't do that anymore. The document, uh, it's a, uh, Well, we grew from 25 measurable outcomes to 412. I forget how many pages the document is. I'm going to show you a few of them. So this is after they said, don't do that anymore. What they did was they branded the, the outcomes with the academic disciplines. Um, but this piece right here says representative indicator. And in the front matter to the document, they define a representative indicator as what was to be measured to see if the goals had been met. So it's the same thing, different label. The student would demonstrate curiosity, open-mindedness, and skepticism in the civic behavior. The student would tolerate ambiguity and paradox. And we were saying, what is that? How do you measure that? What does it look like? Um, Wayne Jones, who was, some of you may remember him, he was a state representative, Democrat, from Summit County, um, invited the state superintendent, Ted Sanders, and me to debate these issues. Um, I was a stay-at-home mom and nobody from nowhere. Very intimidated to have a one-on-one -on -one presentation on opposite sides of an issue with the state superintendent. The location was Cuyahoga Falls High School. Uh, it was in the fall of 93. And um, 
there were probably 800 to 1,000 parents that showed up. It was packed. It was filled. They were standing in the hallways above, back at the back of the auditorium. And all I did, because we didn't have computer systems and PowerPoints and, you know, PDF files and all of this, I just took the old overhead transparencies and put them up on the projector for the parents to see. This is what they're deciding for your children in Columbus. <coughs> and he was booed, um, understandably. This one is probably my favorite slide. Um, again, measurable outcomes for seniors graduating. But they would have hope, healthy coping strategies that they would establish an independent identity. And the best one of all is that they would exhibit a realistic and optimal sense of well-being. <laughs> I'm in my 50s and I, I don't think I'm there yet. <laughs> that is a lifelong process um, and impossible to measure against an objective standard. Um, so this was the system. This was an actual report card from Reynoldsburg City Schools, a suburb of Columbus, for sixth graders. This was brought as a part of testimony to the legislative hearings on House Bill 152. Um, the sixth graders were to be measured whether they were proficient or in progress for problem solving, decision making, communication, goal setting, accessing information, and teamwork. Sounded very similar to those 11 goals. The attitudes label on the report card, sense of self, perspective consciousness, respect of self and others, value of learning and appreciation of change. Again, what is missing? Mathematics, science. reading, science, the academics, history. So, um, having received, I was at the hearing with this, when this was presented to the legislators, um, requested a copy of it, I called the school the next morning. And I uh, just asked to speak with one of the teachers on this team. And I ended up speaking with Mr. Codria. And I asked him about this report card. I said, it's strange to me that I don't see the core academic subjects. And he said, well, there's a second page. I said, well, really, I don't have a second page. What does that look like? Um, he said it was blank. And I said, that's interesting. He said he was explaining that they were instructed to editorialize with a narrative as to where the student was in their academic work. So that was back in 1993, that was 21 years ago. Um, I want to take a look at the assessment data, and this is really the heart of the issue, whether you're talking about Common Core or anything in standards-based education, because what is assessed is what is taught. There is a direct connection between the two, always. Um, we didn't have MP3 files back then, so this is a, a a audio transcription from a, from a tape, a bit of audio cassette tape. This is not a summary, this is verbatim. Um, this was a December 13, 1994 meeting. We, they, the, the budget in 1993 had um, began the transition between the proficiency test system and a different, well, actually bringing in the proficiency test and doing away with the norm reference test like the Iowa Test of Basic Skills and the California Achievement. So the mid-90s is when that happened here in state law in Ohio. The state school board was charged with coming up with uh, setting score standards, which they are today still, setting score standards for the different assessments that are required. Uh, Virgil Brown was an elected member of the board. Uh, he's not an educator in Professionally, he has a, he's a lawyer, judicial, he serves as a judge. I'm sure you all know the name, um, Virgil Brown, Jr. He was fairly new to the board. Uh, they were setting the standards for the fourth grade proficiency test. Oliver Ocasek was the uh, president of the school board at that time. Virgil was dismayed when the department brought a recommendation to the board that the score standard for fourth grade proficiency would be 50%. He said, when I was in school, that was an F. That wasn't proficient. So he, his suggestion in this formal resolution that he brought to bear was that they set the proficient level at least at 70%. 
And his rationale was that would give us a bigger gap of students that would be able to receive remediation and help. Because um, if they were above proficient, they wouldn't get the remediation uh, or the, the assistance. What is important about this conversation with the school board is what the state superintendent said, and this over the last 21 years, 20 years, has been the gift that keeps <coughs> on giving, really. Because what he's saying here is absolutely true. I just couldn't believe he said it in public on tape. He said, if we are forced in the future in the developmental work to make sure we have percentage scores that are at and or above a 70% level means we will have to reframe the whole approach we use in test development to make sure we have sufficient items that are of lower difficulty. <laughs> Do you all get that? <laughs> if we're going to raise the bar, we're going to put stupid questions on the test. We're going to dumb down the test. There's no other way to interpret that. So I would like to show you exactly what happened on test questions. Because in Ohio, there was a gentleman um, in, I believe it was Columbiana County, Salem, Ohio. I'm, back. I'm hoping that I'm right on the county. Uh, it was a farmer did not like the fact that he could not have access to his daughter's 12th grade proficiency test to see the questions. He thought he should be able to look at the questions. He had heard that there were some strange questions on the test, and, and there were some strange questions on the test. So he sued, and it went all the way to the Ohio Supreme Court, and he won. Because of his efforts, those test questions became open public record, and I went crazy with public records requests to get questions. So. Here's a math question about how long, now this is ninth grade state proficiency test, an actual page, not a sample question, not something off of the booklet. Um, this was an actual page from a test. How long is a new standard size pencil? Is it seven inches, seven pounds, seven yards, or seven ounces? Ninth grade, grade math. Not, not so fast. Would you say that again? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Think, think about that very carefully before you determine what the correct answer is. Uh, this one down here is simply reading a thermometer. Now, I am not suggesting that every single question on this test was at this level of stupidity. But they can salt and pepper the questions. What did Dr. Sanders say? He didn't say, we'll make a stupid test. He said, we will include items that are of lower difficulty. And this is very important to understand because there are only two types of standardized tests in the planet in determining what students have learned. Norm referenced and criterion referenced. Ohio moved away from norm referenced assessments that you and I, all, most of us had. When I was little, we took the Iowa Test of Basic Skills. Some of you took the California Achievement. Those assessments had, had a very specific process to determine what was the average performance of the student at a certain grade band, a certain age band. And then you would know if your child was above, if you yourself or your child was above mm -hmm. average, below average, where they fell academically. And they were academically objective questions. In a criterion reference system, the state develops the questions, the state sets the score standards, and that is a moving target. It changes every few years. So you can't even say in 2014, if you're using a state assessment, that you can compare a class of students, or even the same class of students, to test that they took just a few years prior. Because they could have changed the score standard or put different questions on the test. It, it constantly evolves. I want to take you back to 1964. This is a t page from the Iowa Test of Basic Skills in my generation of taking assessments. Here's the thermometer question. Not at ninth grade, at fourth grade. This is serious stuff. This is how far we've fallen in determining what is Proficient. No wonder 40% of the students entering into the universities need remediation. This question here is very similar to the pencil question. About how much does a two-week-old baby bird weigh? The difference, there are two differences. 
These answer choices are all in ounces, not a mixture of weight and length. The nine-year-old is not expected to randomly guess at this answer. They are expected to read the line graph above the question. So it's a, an objective math skill. Let's go back to the uh, state proficiency test, ninth grade citizenship. Please locate the capital of the United States in ninth grade. Multiple choice. Which of the following is not evidence of cultural diversity in the United States? Multiple, multiple choice. Fourth grade citizenship. Miss Berger runs a pretzel factory. Which of the following does she need to make pretzels, fruit, flour, or frosting? <laughs> and this is, this is very telling of the type of test that a criterion reference test is because the state determines the correct answer. This particular question, all of them could fit. If I'm nine years old and I've been to Annie Ann's at the mall, they have blueberry pretzels. If that's my favorite pretzel, that's gonna be my answer at nine years old. If chocolate covered pretzels are my favorite, I'm gonna say frosting, because that's what I like the best. But the state's answer is flour. This is, now we're gonna compare the OGT, or the OATs in sixth grade to the Iowa test in sixth grade. Reading in both grade level to grade level, not jumping grade levels. So this is a very short story about a person who invented earmuffs. And there are five questions to answer about this story. Two on this page and three on the next page. Okay, they're, and they're not, they're not bad questions. It's, it's just the level of difficulty and volume you'll see a stark difference. Here's 1964 Iowa test of basic skills. Um, it's historical fiction about the Revolutionary War. And there's these two questions. There's 19 questions altogether about that, about that story on a range of skills, from vocabulary to comprehension. Um, the level of difficulty is not easy to discern how much more difficult and rigorous the assessments were when I had my elementary education compared to what is expected of students now. This, now we're gonna jump to last year. This is public testimony, the House Education Committee, on the topic of Common Core. It was not open to the public to, for anyone to come testify. There was no bill pending at the time. It was just topically something the chairman scheduled, and he invited three people to come testify. One of those individuals was um, Tom Gunlock, who is currently serving as the State Board of Education Vice President. Um, nothing against Tom Gunlock, but I'm gonna use his testimony. It's 20 pages of testimony. Most of it um, is, I shouldn't say it that way. There are portions of his testimony that are misinformation, that are not representing factual data correctly. But what can't be missed is the very last page of his testimony He was providing to the committee members the current cut scores for the assessments that were set in 2011, the ones that were in use at the time he delivered his testimony. Please take note of what's proficient, because remember back 21 years ago, or 20 years ago, Virgil Brown said 50% is too low, he wanted to raise it to 70% to be proficient. Reading proficient cut score for grade six 35%. This is the state establishing the cutoff for proficiency. And they're assigning um, titles to schools as excellent or you know, academically excellent schools. If you have so many students that are proficient, wow, you've got so many students that are above 35%. <laughs> that, that is not good information. That's not viable information for parents and community members. Math, for seventh grade and eighth grade, 32% and 35% to be proficient. That's not 20 years ago, that's now. 
So when they want to bring in Common Core, which is basically the system nationalized, it's a national set of established standards, national assessments, um, the agreement with, with the um, feds is that we won't add to the standards more than 15 percent. We will, we voted to, to accept their list of standards and along with it the park assessment. There are two different consortiums that split the country in half um, on the assessment, Smarter Balanced and Park. And um, so we have bought into the nationalized version of standards-based education. We don't have a viable means of measuring objectively in a way that's consistent from year to year. I, I don't want to say we've completely lost it, but it seems to be very difficult to get back to what worked. You know, when literacy rates were high, probably six or seven years ago, the Department of Ed made a presentation to the State Board of Education, and the title of the PowerPoint was Ohio's Middle School Literacy Crisis. What is significant about that presentation and why I will never forget it is there were, they had all kinds of data, bar graphs, scatter point plots, graphs, um, pie charts, a lot of information on student performance at the middle school and really describing a level of functional illiteracy in Ohio schools. And I sat there thinking, every student represented on, in that data analysis entered school after we made the switch to standards-based education. Every single one of them, because of the timeline. Not one of those students was educated during the time that we had higher literacy rates and we were do, doing a more objective system. Um, before I, 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 you can just stop me also, whoever's in charge of stopping me for um, length. But I about fell off my chair in the Achievement Committee when this PowerPoint presentation was made by um, Sistine Phillips, who was a senior staff member at the Department of Education. They are setting um, and trying to define what is college and career ready. That's the label now, college and career ready assessments. And um, sh these two slides, see if I can, now I'm going to, can you see where it says here skills, dispositions, and knowledge? Mm -hmm. Same thing as knowledge, skills, and attitudes from 21 years ago. Same three tri domains. Um, and this slide here is talking about the assessment of these areas. Um, let me make this a little bit bigger for you to see. Under dispositions, you've got initiative, resilience, adaptability, leadership. Not everybody is a leader. You can't assess leadership and expect everyone to meet a threshold of leadership. Ethical behavior and civic responsibility, social awareness and empathy, self-control. Um, I asked Sashin Phillips at the end of this presentation if I could have a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, because in the middle of the discussion, she's asking a gentleman in the back of the room from the Department of Education, when a board member asks, does this mean we're going to be testing student attitudes and behaviors again? And she had someone else answer the question, well, we used to call it knowledge, skills, and attitudes, and now we're going to be calling it knowledge, skills, and dispositions. So they haven't missed a beat. They're still marching to the same drumbeat in the assessment system. Um, <coughs> I asked Shashin for a copy. She said, sure, no problem. The, the board meetings are held at the Department of Ed building, so it's not shouldn't be an issue to get a copy from upstairs and bring it downstairs. And the other day, I didn't have it. And the next day, uh, Sashin, I really would appreciate a copy of your PowerPoint. It's public record. Um, no problem. We'll get it to you. I'll have so-and-so from upstairs bring it down. Um, end of the day, didn't have it. Went home. Next day, I'm emailing Sashin. I sure would appreciate a copy of your PowerPoint presentation. Um, no answer. Thursday. Dear Shashin, please send me a copy of your PowerPoint presentation or I will turn in to the Chief Counsel for the Department of Education a more formal and more comprehensive public records request. I had it in 10 minutes. 
What was important about telling you that is if she had given me a hard copy, I would not have had her notes. Because she sent it to me electronically, there was a few things I need to show you. Um, let's go back to this slide. Down here at the bottom, if it's too small to read, I'll read it for you. Content knowledge is an important factor in student success, but is only part of the equation. Measures, that's testing, measures of skills and dispositions contribute above and beyond traditional measures of content and can be used as part of a holistic assessment system. So this is what the media isn't telling you. This is what is not out in the public domain being discussed. But this is what's happening, and this is the, the sort of the sausage making in, in, in setting public policy. Um, this is why there's so much concern when the state hands over the authority to the development of standards to a national group. We end up with a nationalized list, and we can't control anything involving the assessments. We, we can't even see the assessments. Those assessments aren't open public record. We're not going to be able to see the questions or the level of difficulty or what they sprinkle with in terms of putting in questions. But I will show you something in terms of a rubric um, on the Smarter Balance. I don't have the, um, and this is bothersome to me. Um, we'll go to page five on, well, I'll show you the cover page first. So this is the assessment consortium that half the, half the country is using. But it's indicative of where we're at in terms of um, how things are scored and, and why, why a criterion reference test isn't the right tool to use to measure. Um, Lisa had three pizzas. Each pizza was cut into eight pieces. Lisa ate two pieces. How many pieces were left? Write, and write, this is the assignment for the question, write an equation to show how many pieces were left. Now, an equation mathematically has two parts. It has the sentence, and it has what comes after the equal sign. Without that equal sign in both parts, you don't have an equation, right? Two plus two equals four, that's an equation. For, full, to, for the student to get full credit, two points, they would have to write three times eight minus two equals 22, okay? However, on a criterion reference test, you can get partial credit if they create the expression 3 times 8 minus 2. That's not the answer to the question. That, question. that answer is incorrect. Or they just write down the value 22. The question did not say solve the equation. It said write the equation. So if the student is, is expected to know how to write an equation and that's what they're measuring, this correctly answer, solves the equation and, and then if the student was asked to solve, that would be a correct answer. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It, it's, it's, a, it's a way of dumbing down the test, not by putting a less difficult question on there, but by scoring it in a forgiving way. That, it's the same thing. And that is the current type of assessment system that, I mean, that where you can get partial credit for answers. Um, I don't want to, I don't know how we're doing on time. We're good. Okay, we're good. Um, if, what, if you want a really concise explanation of what's wrong with Common Core, Sandra Stotsky uh, provided written testimony to the House Education Committee in the context of House testif testifying on House Bill 237. She was on, now she is not someone who over the years has been, objective, been objecting to the standards-based system. Um, her viewpoint over the years, from my, in my opinion, has been we just need to have a really good list. If we have a really rigorous list, then the system will probably work. I personally disagree with that. I don't think the system is a workable system. And, and, here, and let me give you one more analogy as to why. If you have a standard that everyone has to meet based on a list that you've developed, if I were to say we're going to install a basketball hoop at the front of this room, a standard size, regulation size basketball hoop. And we don't leave tonight until we learn how to slam dunk. 
Some of us are tall, some of us are short. Slam dunking is not shooting the basket and making it in. It's coming up over and bringing the ball into the basket, right? Some of us have arthritis. Some of us, there's, there are various reasons why a portion of us in this room would not be able to meet that standard. So in order for all of us to go home tonight, what do we have to do? You gotta bring the basket down. So everyone has a fair chance of succeeding. That is the flaw, that's the fatal design flaw in standards-based education, is the lowering of the basket. I don't care how good the list is. You could have like that math question I just showed you, that was a decent math question for third grade. But if you have a scoring system that dumbs it down, it's, it's still no good. Um, this, test, this testimony that she provided, now she has been, um, her credentials um, are that she uh, was in the leadership at the Department of Education, I, I'm forgetting offhand, um, in, the, in the state of Massachusetts, but what her title was, it's in here, I don't have it memorized, I apologize. Um, but she served, she was asked to serve on the Validation Committee for Common Core. So she was at the tail end of the process. She was one of the people charged with making sure the list was a good list. And she didn't like the list at the end of it. It was not a good list. Um, she, her testimony is filled with reasons why the policy that supports Common Core is fatally flawed. And if you don't know how to explain Common Core to a legislator or to a colleague or to a parent, um, I'll get this to Doug and you guys can just copy her testimony because it's all in here, basically. Not all of the examples that I shared with you, but it, the common sense rationale is in her testimony. Easy to share. Now, a number of states have withdrawn Common Core standards, have they not? Some have, some are in process. Ohio has a bill pending, House Bill 237. It was introduced last summer. Um, as the states, and I will, call, um, I need to clarify that this, right now on the state's website, the bill pending, as introduced, had some issues that were problematic, um, just in the way the language was worded. It would have enabled the department to get through some loopholes and kind of work, do an end run around the intent. Um, worked with the, the bill sponsor, it was um, redrafted and accepted by the Education Committee as a substitute bill. Um, so I will also send you the substitute bill version of that, because I, I can't find it on the state's website. Do you know where it is? Well, it's not on the website. It's available down at Columbus. Yeah, it's available through the Chairman's office. You could get it through Chairman Doubleton's office. You could get it from um, Representative Andy Thompson is the primary sponsor on that bill. You can get it from his office. You can get it from my office. And you can get it from uh, Representative Lynch's office as well. Um, that piece of legislation, I will just simply show you a couple items in it. Uh, and so you, the copy you have, you want to receive, has this LSC, or it may say, well, it'll say substitute house bill on it. It will not say as introduced. Very important. Um, what it does is it specifically repeals Common Core. The Board of Education shall not adopt and the Department of Education shall not implement the academic content standards for English language arts and mathematics developed by the Common Core Standards Initiative, nor shall the State Board use the Partnership for Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers Park, um, Smart or Balanced, or any other assessment related to or based to the Common Core Standards. Any actions taken to adopt them to date are null and void. So it basically repeals. It's a repeal of Common Core policy in Ohio. Um, there's also some language in here that protects individually identifiable data about students um, being fed into the federal system of data sharing. So there's a, there's a protective element there too on the sharing of data, um, which was very important to include. Um, this bill has not been given the opportunity, well, to be there's some pushback on this bill in Columbus. And I, my personal opinion is it's political pushback. Not principled, political. And um, we, we, there's currently underway a discharge petition to get the bill out of committee. 
So if you have friends and family in other parts of the state, it would be a good idea to contact them to request that this bill, uh, the discharge, they support a discharge petition. I, I believe 50 discharge names. Discharge what? Discharge petition. Sorry if I'm slurring my words at the end of the day. <laughs> um, on that discharge petition, is there a way, I, I was looking on the website and I couldn't get an idea, I couldn't get a list of who had signed the discharge. I don't believe there is a running list. Representative Lynch might be able to address that question. Yeah, the, 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 it's very private, the oh, okay. discharge petition. So Andy Thompson is probably okay. just circulating it, but it's, it's not public yet. As of our last session two weeks ago, maybe a 15 or so signatures on it. So it's, there's a long way to go to get the 15. How many signatures? 50. You have to, 50. If I may. Certainly. Explain what discharge petition is. In, in the legislature, it's the same way in Washington, but the process of passing the bill is very controlled uh, and it works down from the top. So the chairman supplement is chairman of the education committee, but he reports to the Speaker of the House, Speaker Batchelder. Speaker Batchelder really determines what bills he would like to come out of that committee for a vote amount in the House. The Speaker Batchelder, in turn, as you might imagine, that discusses things with the governor. Uh, and so if the, if the leadership doesn't like a bill, it doesn't see the light of day. And, and we could talk about many bills that never see the light of day. But this, this repeal of Common Core is, is definitely uh, sort of dead on arrival in the Education Committee because the effect of repealing Common Core would be a multi-million dollar restart and loss of federal revenue, maybe we'll talk about some of that, but they, they don't want, the, the, no one in, in, the, in the Republican leadership wants to be faced with the embarrassment of saying, holy smokes, why did we ever start this? And, and throw out millions of dollars and school boards across the state are already complaining, gee, we've been trying to conform, now you're talking about repealing it. They're not complaining about the fact that it's gonna dumb down our kids and destroy the educational system, they're complaining about the, the work and the money involved. All of that to say, the only way to overcome that process by which the leadership controls the bill, keeps it in committee, and prevents it from getting voted, the only way to overcome that is by what's called a discharge petition. A discharge petition is where individual House members essentially sign a short petition that says, I want to vote on this bill. And it forces the bill out of the committee process, over the Speaker's head, and to the floor of the House, where all the members then get a chance to vote on it. And so the only way that happens is for folks to lean on their state representatives. I've already signed uh, my William Yelsky, so here, who's the state representative in this area. I don't know if she's signed or not, but you, you, the only way to get those 50 signatures, particularly in election year, should be to say, I'm not gonna vote for you unless you're supporting the, the, the discharge petition for the repeal of Common Core. Discharge petitions are rare. Um, there are actually two that are out right now, the heartbeat bill and, and the repeal of common court bill. But I think these are the first two discharge petitions that have been introduced in decades. Because when you introduce a discharge petition, and Andy Thompson, who, who is the sponsor of the bill, and I'm one of the co-sponsors, uh, is to be really given a lot of kudos here. Because when you, when you issue a discharge petition and say, to your fellow members, please sign this, you're saying to the speaker, well, I know you don't like this, but I'm going to try to do it anyway. And, and that doesn't make you get warm and fuzzy to believe in the party. And I know how not to get warm and fuzzy in the party. <laughs> this is one of them. Uh, so, so, so really, and this is so extraordinarily important, that like so many things that I know that you discussed, but absolutely uh, phone calls and emails uh, to members, uh, on the, uh, any members of the House, but certainly your local local member, and tell them you must sign the discharge petition is the only way this is going to be done. And, and we have the summer to work on this because uh, we're going to be in, in session a few weeks in the fall. And if this doesn't get done you know, by the end of this year, it's, it's, everything's thrown out at the end of the two-year legislative cycle. We've got to start all over next year. So. Matt, if you're not in the person's district, but you call, call as many as you can. Sure. Do they pay any attention to you and let you? Well, sure. They, I mean, I, you know, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate to call people outside of your district and, and, and just say you know, that you're telling all your friends in his district <laughs> not to vote for them <laughs> if they don't support them. So, you know, yeah, yeah, I mean, people. Thank you very much. How much money is at risk? 
lots. Million, I don't know, there's perhaps millions. Well, the, there's an excess of what happened back in the first stimulus bill when President Obama was elected. Seed money was provided to the Department of Education. And um, they used the seed money for what was called Race to the Top. Um, the Race to the Top grants then were given, some districts voluntarily stepped forward and said, we'll participate in Race to the Top. Um, so that was, that first stimulus bill was issued in 2009. So we're coming to the end of a five-year commitment on those monies. I, to be honest, I would venture to say, and it's just an opinion, that when you get to the end of that budget cycle, which is basically where we're at now, there's not going to be, I, don't, I honestly don't think there's going to be a huge recall of three or four hundred million dollars. There was a, um, and I, will, I will qualify what I'm about to say as second hand, because I really think it's important to give you first hand information, primary source documents, so that you, you're not hearing my opinion, you're hearing, you're seeing it for yourself. But uh, at a recent national meeting of state boards of education members, um, it's my understanding that a question was raised of a, an official from in the meeting, who was physically in the meeting, from the U.S. Department of Education, who has a, a authority to, to be accurate on what would happen to the dollars for states that give back the monies. He, he said to that group, we're not going to logistically spend the time going back after that money. So that is, it's a reality that the money was granted to us. We signed on the dotted line with strings attached. This is what we're going to do. Um, and logistically, they could pull back in at least a portion in the final phase of that five-year cycle. Uh, I, I don't know that they would have the authority for sure to come back after the whole amount of money that we've already been implementing for the last few years um, that would be applied to what we've been implementing. I want to show you a memorandum of agreement between the Board of Education and the Chancellor and the, and the Department of Education. So you have three um, entities here on this memorandum. And it is for terms and conditions of working with the um, College and Work Ready Assessment System, which was really, um, uh, nails were put into that coffin in, in House Bill 487, which is, was just passed this month. Um, this is for the use of the park assessments here in Ohio. It's a very important clause. Uh, this was signed in September of 2012. That's uh, Debbie Terhar is the president of the State Board of Education, an elected member. And then it was also signed by, at that time, Michael Sawyers was an interim superintendent, and Jim Petro was the chancellor of the Board of Regents. But take a look at this little paragraph right here. Termination by notice. In the event changes in either state or federal law or regulations occur, which render performance here under illegal, void, which House Bill 237 does, impractical or impossible, this agreement shall terminate immediately. So in terms of our agreement with PARC, it's severable. They, that, what we have, the, the entities signed with one another and agreed that the state would not move forward and they would cease and desist if circumstances changed that made the use of the park assessments, uh, what does it say, illegal, void, impractical, or impossible. So, you know, it's, I, I think a cost-effective way of rolling back those policies is to simply institute the use of norm reference assessments. Yes. My question is, I have two, um, two boys, one just graduated from high school a few weeks ago, and the other is a sophomore, just finished his sophomore year in Solon, and um, so I have a lot, <laughs> we've taken a lot of tests, I'm pretty familiar with the tests, I've heard a lot of things about these tests, I could tell you a lot of stories about bad questions on the tests, but I won't do that right now. Um, so the question, question is, well, first of all, when we were growing up, when I was going to school in the 80s, we, um, we didn't have the graduation tests or the achievement tests. But we didn't also didn't, I grew up uh, in the Cleveland area in Beachwood. We also didn't have the, the norm test that you're talking about. 
just the SAT, maybe the PSAT. Right. There were there weren't really standardized tests, and I had some good education and some education that wasn't so great. So I think that there's something to be said for having some kind of standards because otherwise you have no way to assess if your schools, you know, if your if the children are learning. But then also my question is then if we roll back the Common Core, then we're just back, aren't we just back to the Ohio graduation test? How would we move to an, a, a true right. test like we, you were describing? What what we, we can look at, and, and basically, if, if, if anyone in, policy, in a policy setting position of authority, like a legislator or a state board of education member, says to you, Ohio is a local control state, that is not a true statement. Back when we had the norm reference assessments, and I don't know, do you remember taking anything when you were in elementary school? In elementary school. Okay. In elementary school. So in elementary, elementary school, school, they're yeah. tracking where you are yeah, in terms of yeah. comparing you to the average performance for your age and grade. I remember that, yeah. Um, the SATs, the ACTs, the precursors to those that are used in high school, those are norm reference assessments. Some of them are. The, the educational testing service is morphing into criterion referenced products, but there are products that are norm referenced. Um, the ACT that's used for students to get into college, wow, what a concept. You know, you've got an ACT score, that's a norm reference test. I had heard that that um, was possibly going to be a part of, mm -hmm. our principals mentioned that one of those tests may be part of the graduate They're trying to create, um, they're trying to build in some options okay. for, for testing. Um, but the tools that I've seen referenced mention standardized but not norm referenced in statute. And the ACT does have a criterion referenced um, end of course tool, like an end of course for algebra or end of course, those are criterion referenced tools. Um, what's important to understand too is if we roll back and look at what the statute said when we did have local control. When, when I was teaching school, um, the, the schools had what was called a graded course of study or a scope and sequence of what was to be taught at each grade level. <coughs> and so there was an expectation of what was to be taught. Um, when you shift, it, it, it's a paradigm shift. When you stop saying this is what we want you to teach over to this is what we want students to show us that they have learned and that's where you set the standard is in the testing part of it, that's when the system becomes very, um, uh, it's like nailing jello to a wall. It changes all the time. It, it, but those, those scope and sequence lists didn't change. This is what we want teachers to teach. And, it, and teachers knew what were, what were expected of them. And they weren't constantly thinking, oh, well, what are they going to expect of me this year? This is going to be different next year. and It's going to constantly change. Instability was created when we shifted paradigms, is really what happened. And um, so, it, it, I, in my opinion, it's very cost effective to just go back and hit the reset button, you know, hit, hit the restart button and, and go back to what it was when we were using the types of products that educational, and there were other testing companies that were making products. Um, uh, the Terra Nova is a so normal reference test. I mean, if this, if this bill, would to um, go through, would, would we not well, be just back to the, OG, the OGT? And no, the, not, if we, not if the statute was written in such a way. Okay. And this, yes, if, if Common Core is repealed, immediately it would go back to, the, to, to what was in policy prior to those to Common Core. Yes, it would go immediately back to the OGT. But it would give legislators a platform to say, look, is this where we really want to be, or should we really examine the system itself? Um, so 237 is just a starter of the process of getting um, local control restored. Local control is not a, a, a four-letter word. I mean, it's not a nasty term. Local control is allowing communities to decide what, the, what they want to do to make their system what's taught more rigorous. It, it has a greater amount of accountability to parents and taxpayers at the local level. If we can't get state legislators to listen to us to even get 237 out of committee, what does that say about their perspective on what parents 
the voice that parents should have in terms of their own child's education. And I would just like to say, as, part, as a teacher, um, they put these articles in the paper saying the teachers are all for this. The teachers have no choice because 50% of their evaluation is on this, these tests. Now the school will start giving the part assessments in, this, in September. And, but the, the kids have been being tested complete a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I teach uh, um, in the early grades, and this year I saw the kindergarten kids sent down to the gym with headphones on their head, heard it, sat in front of a computer, and it wasn't for a few minutes. It was for several hours, several times a week. And it's going to get more when the park assessments are included because they're going to do maps testing and park assessments. And some and of the assessments you're talking about are provided to kindergarten students in the first month of school. Yes, some of, that's uh, exactly I, I spoke to an exactly. urban kindergarten teacher, and some of the students in the urban districts, they don't have computers in their home. Yeah. You know, and, and the teacher is not allowed to say, yeah. this is how you use the system. This is how you use the computer. Yeah. They're just, they just randomly sit these children in front of these machines and expect the children to figure it out. Excuse me. Yeah. What, was, what was, I have a question. What, were the, what, was, what was being piped through the uh, headphones? The test. The test. They're sitting at a computer, the headphone is on, and the instructions are, you know, um... Because five-year-olds can't read yet. They have know, to... These are for the kids that can't read. Yes. It'll say, you know, what's... I, I think we can turn the lights on. Picture, you, you know, which is number two, so you have to touch. This one is number two, or whatever the... And at the high school level, I understand there are quite so many, I mean, your assessments, our principal told us they're needing to take lots and lots of instructional time a lot. Right. So That's what some of the urban weeks, teachers are saying at the elementary testing, level, yeah. is we spend so much time testing that we're losing very valuable time in teaching the important foundational skills. Yes. One of the problems is the money. And the money is that every single test that these kids all across America or take part tests are $35 a piece. And when they don't pass them, they repeat them. So just imagine every child in America taking a $35 part test over and over again. That is where it's, these people, you know, want the money. It's about, a lot of it's about the money. And then uh, the seed money you spoke about, Bill and Melinda Gates, uh, they have actually come out now and said that they, um, they think that uh, this should all be delayed. Even the people that started the process with the seed money, you know, $200 million from the foundation, are now saying it should be, uh, it should be delayed for over two years. Okay. Then I did find that there is a new branch of science for the STEM part of this. Uh, what is that? Science, technology, technology engineering, engineering, engineering. Okay. Um, there is a new branch of technology called computational, uh, sci I mean science, called computational science. I found it in a strange way. It comes from Japan, and it, uh, the man that developed computational science is from Austin, Texas. He won the Onda Prize in Japan the year, which is like the Nobel Prize, for a new branch of science. Now, if you look up computational thinking, we've talked about critical thinking and creative thinking. Now there's just a new way to think called computational thinking. Now our children are going to have something called Python program, programs, which is uh, free and new and based on computation. So this is scary. This is really, because our children will be little automatons if, if computational thinking is what they're going to be developed, is how they're going to develop. This is brand new. It's going on now. And so the part tests are $35 a piece. That's the, they don't want to give up any of that money, okay? Right. 
then uh, this new branch of science, which anybody can Google and look up, is called computational, and the science will be Python programs, which is actually about decomposition. Everything is decomposing, like a recipe. You take all the parts and take it out. Right. And, uh, and also, even the Gates Foundation that started the whole ball rolling with the seed money, and then they got the stimulus money involved, and really uh, uh, bribed the states to go in on this without sight unseen standards. With sight unseen standards, they adopted Common Core because of the money. So people need to really look at this because it's scary. It's the scariest thing we'll ever deal with for our children. There is nothing to compare with it. We call it Obama Core. What's the not Common Core? What's the discussion at the State Board of Education these days about this? There are a few members that raise concerns. Just and it really is helpful to get those concerns on record that the, the leadership of the board, the pun intended on board in terms of pressing forward with Common Core. Who benefits? Um, I don't I don't see an upside to the use of Common Core. I don't. There is none. Um, the, in terms of benefit, I, I don't, it's a political hot potato. I don't know why um, members of either party would want to hang on to this. It's, it's, it's um, for the people who understand what it is, it's super unpopular. Arnie Duncan was on Good Morning America this morning, mm -hmm. outing Common Core, right. and he got nothing but softball questions from Charlie Rose. Right. Administrators. They don't anything important, they just uh, right. let him it's, spout on how great it is. Administrators in, in school, at the school district levels, their perspective is this is just another fad that we have to put up with until it gets done. <laughs> and so there's no, there's no professional pushback from the field. They're so used to the, the state going from one fad, bunny hopping from one fad to the next. Do parochial schools have to uh, pass this? They yes. have to pass part of the, the parochial schools are going to be given an option on um, not doing the end of course exams but they're not going to be given a pass on the um, total park assessment. Well, based on those the questions, I, that's not going to be a problem for anybody. <laughs> I mean, seriously. <laughs> the it is. We don't know that because there could be embedded questions that deal with the affective or the dispositional domain that where political correctness really becomes the state's correct answer. So depending, you know, we won't know until we look inside that box. For years I have been describing this as a process of taking off the wrapping paper and looking in the box. You know, we, all we can see right now is the wrapping paper on park. We don't get to see the questions. Um, and, you know, you may be correct, and there may be a perception among the private schools that if this is going to be a, a, a dumbed-down scoring mechanism or dumbed-down questions, our kids aren't going to have any problems with it. There may be some validity to that, but the point is that the system is not going to accurately show what these kids have mastered, mm -hmm. what they know. Um, and they're copyrighted, and that if they're copyrighted, this, right. um, the General Education Provision Act right. uh, says standards uh, are copywritten, and as a state, we cannot change them. Who's providing the best leadership on alternatives to Common Core right now? Well, Andy Thompson is doing a yeoman's job in terms of. Who's Andy Thompson? Andy Thompson is a state representative okay. here, um, in Ohio. here in Ohio. On the he board is of education. He's not on the state board of education. He is a member of the General Assembly. If I, if I may say, Sarah Fowler, who is on the yes. state board of education, is also a leader fighting yes. Common Core. And if you go to the website Ohioans Against Common Core, <laughs> I can't seem to get good reception, but um, they have a lot of information on their website, including the scorecard and what state reps have signed the discharge petition. So, so, so. <laughs> 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 I'm serious, because I think that will show how, why we've seen the dumbing down of, um, of America. Right. I know there's one teacher at St. Rita's who has reversed how he teaches. 
his class and it seemed to have a good effect. They watch a video of his lecture at night and in the daytime during class, they do the homework. That way, the, the teacher is there to answer their questions, explain in more detail. And I think you need to have some innovative techniques. You don't need common core, you just need to reach the children in different ways that will, will make them understand that two plus two does equal. I need to address the question of Sarah Fowler because for the fir we are the first state in the nation to have a sitting member, elected member of the State Board of Education be a graduate of being home educated. I have been attending the State Board of Education meetings for a couple of decades. I have watched a lot of members come on and off that board. And um, the integrity that that young woman, um, and even, even her age was unique. I believe she was 23 when she was elected. Um, and she won with more than 60% margin in a three-person race. Uh, she, did not, she, she did not slack off in terms of wanting to get out, meeting people, letting people know where she stood on issues. I am uh, uh, affiliated with nonprofits. I am not here to speak of this year's election. I can't do that uh, since I've been introduced as a part of these nonprofits. But I can comment on the activity of a sitting board member. And I place her, in my personal opinion, of all of the aged board members and experienced and those who come from universities and those who come from this and that, she's in the top five in the last two decades. In terms of the quality of her service, the amount of time she devotes to understanding the policy issues, and, and being responsible with every single vote she makes on that board. You all have an excellent board member. Um, it shouldn't make any difference if she was home educated or not. She's, she's great. Uh, if we haven't seen any of the actual questions from the test, and how do you know this is another example of the dumbing down of America, as you called it? Very good question. If we haven't seen the test, how do we know it's another example of the dumbing down? Um, we've seen, for example, I showed you an example of the scoring rubric on how they are going to use this partial credit system for scoring. That is an example of dumbing down. Um, in terms of the questions, because I showed you some very ridiculous questions on the state's developed assessments, um, we're not going to know unless they let us peek in there and see. There's no way to know. Um, we can look at, um, and, and again, Sandra Stotsky's testimony is very telling in terms of the quality of the standards. If the quality of the standards are um, inappropriate for grade levels, then you're going to get assessments that are just as inappropriate for grade levels. Right, but so, so far as actual like, hard evidence is concerned for the content of the test, there isn't any to, to suggest that. This is just another, so that this is the um, same content, just wrapped in it. Right. Right. Uh, right. right. How much that, if they were proud of their product, though, if they were really proud of it, it would not be hidden in dark. It would be open for everybody to see. And again, you have to look at the standards. All parents to see, and they keep this stuff hidden right. from parents, which is why, the, as a parent, the red flag immediately waves in front of your face. Right, can you just say that's because that the tests themselves don't think have been developed yet. I'll get it and finish it. And the tests haven't been like administered yet. got this right. in a drawer somewhere waiting right. to come, waiting to come I'm out. Saying that's, I'm saying no, I, it's, a, it's a good it's a question. question. It's a great yeah, question. I don't have an answer, but I, I've seen how these guys act up until now. Right. The last, what, six years, five years, six years, and this is their MO, so I don't have any doubt that they have these questions all sitting ready to be. And again, back to what Dr. Stotsky was guys, The people who are running this show, the people who are promoting Common Core, the people, Hardy Duncan, for example, right. uh, the current Hardy administration, Duncan. these are the guys who are all invested in this. Somebody else asked, uh, you know, Normally, when you want to know what's going on, you say follow the money, right? So it's hard to follow the money here, but you can follow the results of this. One is uh, you've got a student population that is half as smart as we were at half the age 20 years ago, okay? So you're, you're creating a, a basically a group of epsilons. Going back to Brave New World, you're creating epsilon. Why would you want epsilon? Okay? That's one. And two, uh, you can also look at the people who are making these tests. They're making a lot of money, so you can follow the money that way, but you're creating a bunch of stupid people who are going to be dependent on someone or something, which is government. Okay? Right. 
why would government want stupid people? Well, the stupid people tend to vote one certain way. So you're creating a whole class. I'm not gonna, we're gonna keep politics out of it, but you're creating, you're creating a whole huge class of people that can always be guaranteed to vote in a certain way in perpetuity. Okay? So you're not really following the money necessarily, you're following the votes, which means money. So that's but back to the, the core of your question is t testing is related to this. The, the assessments are based on the standards. The curriculum will follow and be um, aligned to the assessments. So if, Sand if you look at Sandra Stotsky's testimony, because she does have a good handle on what that process looked like at the end when the standards were being adopted, and her concern was rigor. So if the standards aren't rigorous, well, there's no expectation whatsoever that the assessments are going to be rigorous. Yes? That just seems very strange to me because, I, I mean, any government organization or state-led organization can lie, like we know that. But the, pretty much the word that comes up, I think, the most on the actual <coughs> website for the Common Core is rigor. So why would you see that the way that we're improving is we're making it more rigorous when, in, in effect, it's actually less rigorous? They said it was going to be more rigorous in 1993, and I showed you what that looked like. Rigor is a word that's very loosely used in terms of um, the education circles, in terms of policy setters and, and those who are behind the scenes developing these things. This, this is an example of something that was considered rigorous. And when I look at this, this is an actual fifth grade math exercise. I'm thinking visual discrimination, count how many squares are in the square, you know, it's sort of a visual discrimination exercise. Not what was asked of the students of this particular exercise. How did I feel and what did I notice? I felt it was easier and there were a lot of squares. There are three substantial misspelled words in those answers. They were. Right. Easier is misspelled in question one. Where is misspelled? The rigor at the time this was used in a suburban, wealthy school district in Summit County. Um, the program that was being used for spelling at this time was, was, was called inventive spelling. That was not that long ago. Um, this is a Again, when we were told that the standards were going to be rigorous, this is second grade math, understanding subtraction. You can see some birds are leaving the nest, so that's a subtraction problem. Listen to the math story, a new nest is best. Two birds left to find new nests. How do you think the other bird felt? What much test is this for? It's the result of all this. It's not a test, it's what ends up in the classroom. <laughs> I was invited to, to, after I debated Dr. Sanders, remember at the beginning of the presentation I said I debated Dr. Sanders. Within a month I received a phone call from his office asking me to come down and sit with the Director of Assessments, the Director of Professional Development, the Director of Curriculum Development. There were about eight or ten people around the table. Um, Roger Trent at that time was the Director of Assessments. And um, I asked him about a question that was posed on the 12th grade proficiency test, which I think was part of the reason why um, Mr. Ray sued the state to see his daughter's test. We had heard secondhand that one of the questions on the writing portion, which was being piloted, um, was that um, two people walk into your office to be hired, one is African American, one is Caucasian, who do you hire? Um, that's a stupid question, uh, by any measure. So I asked Dr. Trent, I said, why was that question on the 12th grade um, practice or the field test? And he never denied the question was real. He said, well, we don't score based on how they answered the question. We score based on grammatical structure and different things of that nature that were technical. I said, but Dr. Trent, what happens to the answer sheets? They call them protocols. What happens to the protocol when the students finish with the test? Where does that go? It goes back to the testing company. And what do they do with it? He said, well, they're under contract. They're legally obligated to shred the protocols. This is back in the 90s. I said, I've read those contracts. 
in the contract, you're correct, they're asked to shred the protocols, but there's no requirement that they can't store that information electronically before they shred the paper. And I handed him a list of entities that were using that information off of different state assessments and selling it for um, what they called psychographic research. There's a different term for it now, but it's big business now, you know, to do all of these different types of um, marketing techniques. And they were using information off of state assessments to, to do that. So my comment, which goes back to what our discussion is here, um, my comment to Dr. Trent was, it doesn't matter what you intend. What matters is, if it's a question on a test, or what matters is what is in front of that child to instruct that child? What is being used to shape that child's perspective and develop skills or shape their dispositions, you know, shape their perspective on things. Um, this, is, this is one, this was an early one, a parent in the Atlas City Schools got me involved in um, their tribes program, um, and where literally the teachers would group children and name them the Cherokee tribe, the Iroquois tribe, you know, they were named tribes and they were discussed, they were basically peer-centered group therapy sessions. The teacher was not allowed to participate in the conversations, she was only allowed to make sure that and students could speak without uh, being ridiculed or the, the rules were followed and discussion rules. So this is an activity, um, grades three to adult, so this was at least used in third grade on up. Pose a question of personal interest in nature um, to the tribe or subgroup and give them time to consider their answers. What is the best book you've ever read? How do you select your friends? What guides your life? What is the greatest harm one can do towards one another? Why? For what do you think you would lay down your life? There's no academic value to this type of activity. What grade was it? Um, third grade, fourth grade, elementary. Jeez. Is it true that, that, that children, when they pass these tests around third grade, after that, much of their future can be in some ways determined whether they'll go to vocational schools? I don't know that. I, I, there's talk about that. There, there is talk about that. I, I can't conclusively say that is actually what is happening. Um, and there are people who have done more research than I that would be um, disagreeing. I, I just personally don't know the answer to that that way. Yes? Two questions. One, I'm confused by the fact that we seem to not care at all about, we seem to have an extremely strong emphasis on only mathematics, English, science. And, Earlier in the presentation, you were, in a sense, kind of poking fun of the fact that the goals, nothing academic about them, they were just feelings, emotions, like that. Mm -hmm. Isn't the point of school and a high school education to prepare someone for the actual world? Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, the natural world isn't a math test, it's dealing with people. So interpersonal skills, collaboration, those are very important skills. Why are we ridiculing this in favor of? seven times four. I'm not sure if seven times four is going to be as important as being able to express your feelings. In order to no problem. Matter. I understand the question. Um, let me sort of put it in a perspective. Um, good teachers will always make sure that children respect one another, that there is opportunities for students to work together on projects. Um, so those, you're building in those, those soft skills that you're describing or have always been a part of a classroom environment. Where it becomes problematic is when someone is setting a standard to say this is what it has to look like. It really is counterintuitive to having diverse viewpoints, for example. You want to be able, see, tolerance is, is really a word that's tossed around without much thought these days. We, we, we talk about the word tolerance, but we don't really understand that from one perspective, tolerance is you have to agree with me or you don't tolerate me. Another perspective is I can treat you well and disagree, and it's okay to disagree. So if the state's viewpoint is A and my viewpoint is B, then that's putting students in a classroom environment where um, they, especially the younger students, don't have the maturity, the discernment, they don't have the capacity of years of experience 
to be able to say, hey, wait a minute, that's not right. When it, when, so what you're talking about in terms of preparing for the real, real world, um, we have a room full of people that were prepared, well prepared for the real world, and we didn't have the soft skills built into our requirements that we had to master something. Um, and like I said before, you know, when you expect students to show leadership qualities, not everyone's a leader. We are all hardwired differently. And there are some very shy people in the world that have become very successful people, you know, in terms of, of um, their ability to make a living and, and impact the world. Um, I, I never thought I would be doing any public speaking at all. I mean, I, in fact, to this day, and I've been doing these meetings, hundreds of them, um, I can't eat dinner before I speak to a group because it just makes me nauseous. <laughs> um, to add on to what you just said, um, my father could teach me how to be a man. He could teach me how to be a caring son, eventually a caring and loving, fa uh, loving father myself which are skills that I really can't learn and shouldn't learn in school. We have, we had families, had families, but had families. We had pastors and rabbis. We had, uh, you know, synagogues and churches that helped us to develop these other skills to teach us how to be better human beings. Um, those people, uh, the, the rabbi that I had was never going to teach me economics, math, etc. That's what school is for. Uh, so, I don't know if that helps to answer the question. So where we came from to where you kind of No, I now. definitely understand that works great for this particular group of people, but there are plenty of people who don't have the strong down support systems, don't belong to any, have had no religious affiliation. So for them who have the max of Roman home, they don't have a strong father figure, he's always at work. Their mother isn't going to be around to teach them how to be a man. They're not involved in their church or their synagogue. So where are they going to learn how to be a respectful, tolerant? It's a part of the cultural problem. The family value of being raised the right. same. We all didn't come from the same values. I mean, we all basically came from the same values, but our parents weren't always equal. Some were better, some were not. But we all have our own free choice on what we ferret through and identify what works and what doesn't work how we want to be treated and how others should be treated as to how we want to be treated. So it's a trial and error process. This has no business being taught in school. I'm, that's an awful, I feel an awful lot of responsibility to put on a seven-year-old kid. Well, let me, let me no get you. It's different than when I grew up and when right. your parents grew up and when your grandparents grew up. Right. It's how the world has evolved. Right. Um, how many of you have heard the name Ben Carson? Yeah. Okay, so you all know who he is. We interviewed him, and I would suggest that you go back onto the archives for American Policy Round to the, to the public square. We, we had a great interview with him, and he described, um, and, and, and forgive me, if this is, we had some off-air conversations, so I don't know if, if what I'm telling if you go listen to it, if you'll actually hear him actually say this, but um, he was raised, um, his mother was a single mom, and she was illiterate, and she would make him read he never knew she couldn't read because she would make him sit and read to her while she's making dinner, while she's making dinner and doing different things. And um, he, so she, he came from a background that would be indicative of the problematic single mom. You know, she herself had not gone past third grade, I think he said. Um, yet here he is, a very um, accomplished surgeon and who's done so much in terms of his accomplishments in the medical field and but his perspective was not shaped at school it was not shaped at school it was shaped by a mom who knew she wanted something better for her son so um, and we we do have a lot of caring teachers in the classroom who would like it it, it doesn't it does a disservice to these children who are already coming from a, a background that would um, not give them um, <coughs> the advantages of um, stability, to not teach them how to read, to not teach them how to, to do math well, to not give them the academic foundation that they need. 
you know, the whole look and guess method and teaching reading and getting away from phonetics. I mean, we could go all night long on just on the academics. You had mentioned that um, parochial schools are included in this as well to an extent. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if what we're saying is true that we should only teach academics in school and everything else at home, then why would anyone send their kids to a parochial school? You should teach them their religious beliefs at home. Let me clarify again. I'm not saying we should only teach academics. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I am not saying we should only teach academics at school. Good teachers have always taught the soft skills. They've always had an expectation in their classroom of respect, of um, turning work in on time, a work ethic, um, completing your work, um, paying attention to the teacher, not speaking when other people are speaking, all of those things. You, teachers teach that. It's not built into the testing system. So parochial schools will continue, and good public school teachers, and, and good private public, whatever, good teachers will continue to have those expectations for students. It should not be a third party, other than the local district and the parent, determining what that looks like and how it should be scored. Um, isn't the reality on the ground, though, in any, in any profession, that you know, I wouldn't have great engineers, you'll have these engineers, you're not always have great teachers, you'll have some great teachers, some bad poor teachers. So isn't this a fine thing to have for those, fine for those teachers who are good teachers, they're already, they're already going to have this integrated into their normal curriculum. No. Those who aren't good teachers, then this is a specific exercise for them to... No, it won't, it won't be integrated into the curriculum, it'll be integrated into their pedagogy, to how they, how they interact with students and what their expectations are. Um, and really, the, 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 ish, the problem is also is, you know, if you talk to someone who's an engineer, a friend of mine is an engineer um, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. He said, we are not getting the engineers we used to have. We, we are not getting the quality of engineers coming into the field that we need to, for, the, for our systems to, do, to excel and to continue to grow and improve and et cetera. So we're, we're, it's a feeder system. If you don't lay those foundational skills, if, it, if you cannot allow teachers to spend time teaching, then you're watering down the system with time and expectations and testing on things that are um, um, weakening the educational system as a whole. Okay. All right, one more question. I, I'm sorry. I just wanted to bring up some points. Sue and I went to the Comments on Concord. First one was at the Ohio House in November, and Sandy Stosky was there. Yes. And several other professionals, and it was very good. We got an audio feed. And none of the professionals liked the you know, standards or liked any of the content of this. The second one we went to was Ohioans Against Common Core in April. And I bring this up because these are the people who, in Columbus, I'm sorry. Um, these are the speakers, and again, they were very good in their fields. But you can bring up, go to Ohioans Against Common Core, besides the facts that Matt said, you can bring up the featured presentation and listen to every one of their um, you know, testimonies. And I suggest, I thought Terrence Moore was very good. His um, title was The End of Storytelling. And he goes on about you know, how they're getting rid of literature. And, and how students understand it sound. But it's worth the time. And we also went to one in Middlebrook Heights with David Barton, and he was very good. He was a constitutionalist and a historian. And it was funny when we talk about tests, he showed us, I think it was in the 1800s. Oh my the gosh, they were so smart. The kids, <clears throat> the kids back then so, were brilliant. We just looked at it and we to didn't compare it to today. today. So, it was scary yeah. how smart kids used to be in fourth grade and fifth grade. Oh. Okay. Anybody else have a quick question? I you? Just a oh, yeah. comment about your peer interaction and how when we were young, if you were talking to somebody, you would know immediately the effect that you had on that person and you could build your friendships and that. Now with all these kids texting and everything. <laughs> <laughs>